Anyway, I guess we get started. Um, everybody, I'm really delighted to welcome Anna Krasen, Dr. Anna Krasen. Anna is a postdoctoral fellow who is working with Mati Totatiri and Erica Middleton. And um, today she's going to be talking about the role of cognitive control in comprehension treatment in aphasia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurel. That was really, very really great of you. Um, all right, everyone, I think we're ready to start. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, today I'm going to be talking about the role of cognitive control in comprehension treatment in a beta. And uh, today's Schreier Family Topics in Rehabilitation Science lecture is supported by a generous gift from Nancy and Mark Schreier, and we are grateful for their support and belief in our mission. Uh, here is just a slide with uh, CME credits. I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, just a reminder, this code will expire at noon tomorrow. And I'm going to also show this slide uh, at the end of my presentation. And here is a slide with a financial disclosure, uh, disclosure announcement. Okay, so um, the objectives of today's talk is uh, are the following. So I hope that at the end of this session, you will be able to recognize the role of cognitive control in language comprehension, explain the relationship between cognitive control deficits and comprehension deficits, as well as preliminarily evaluate potential cognitive control treatments for aphasia. And I'm gonna start off by saying that aphasia is this multifaceted disorder. It's primarily a disorder of language and communication that affects uh, speaking, writing, uh, comprehending, and also uh, reading. And it affects up to 40 people uh, following a stroke. Aphasia is also associated with increased length of hospital stay, mortality, and disability, as well as reduced independence and social participation. It's also associated with increased risk of depression and mental fatigue. And although there have been many advancements in, in neurorehabilitation and in understanding the mechanisms underlying aphasia, it still remains a relatively understudied condition that actually poses challenges to, uh, to treatment programs to generalize the outcomes. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to focus on uh, language comprehension deficits in aphasia. So language comprehension deficits uh, have received less attention in both treatment and research in comparison to, for example, language production deficits. And the reasons for that may be twofold. First of all, comprehension often operates under the hood, making it inherently more challenging to study than, for example, verbal expressions. But also comprehension deficits are multi-determined, such that they may stem from impairments in, in other modalities, so for example, in executive functions. And one particular executive function that I'm gonna be focusing on today is cognitive control. And cognitive control, or like a specific aspect of cognitive control, is this ability to detect and resolve conflict between mental representations. And cognitive control has been shown to have a strong link with both language comprehension and production. Okay, so why is it important to study uh, cognitive control in language comprehension in a data? Well, let me give you an example. Imagine you're, um, you're sitting in a cafe with your friends, you're having a conversation, it's pretty noisy, there's a lot going on, right? For speech comprehension to be successful, uh, you actually need to integrate various multimodal linguistic and non-linguistic cues in real time, okay? And these cues have different degrees of informativeness, and they can sometimes compete for influence, which sometimes actually leads to uh, temporal misinterpretation or uncertainty. And such temporal misinterpretations can be caused by various, uh, various factors, for example, by noise in the cafeteria or by unfamiliar accent. So probably some of you, you know, listening to my talk today will have those temporal misinterpretations. Hopefully there won't be too many of them. But also even the, the information itself can contain some ambiguous, uh, ambiguous cues or conflicting information, okay? And let me give you a striking example to illustrate this. So if you hear a sentence such as, the doctor was treated by the patient, you need to assign thematic roles to the doctor and the patient to make sure you know who's performing an action on call. And probably the first interpretation that comes into your mind is that it was actually the doctor who was treating the patient and not the other way around, right? So this is actually an example of a conflict. We have a conflict between the information that's coming, that's imposed by syntax, 
and that's imposed by semantics or word knowledge. To resolve this conflict, we actually can, uh, can use cognitive control. So we actually need this cognitive control for a successful comprehension or interpretation of such a sentence. How does it look like um, in terms of uh, people with aphasia? So people with aphasia often struggle with the sentences uh, containing conflicts, so the ones I just showed you uh, in a previous slide. And actually, um, studies also from our group, but also others, have shown that the, the actual difficulty in comprehension may arise from impairments in, in cognitive control, as compared to, for example, impairments at the level of linguistics, so for example, uh, syntax or semantics. And in fact, cognitive control deficits are also one of the causes of poor comprehension recovery outcomes. All right, so what could be the sources of cognitive control variability in, uh, in aphasia? So why some people with aphasia can actually recruit cognitive control and resolve conflicts, so interpret sentence correctly, versus others cannot? Well, first of all, we can talk about individual differences. So there's actually a high degree of within and between individual variability in cognitive control abilities that, that can actually impact whether a person with aphasia recruits cognitive control for a given task or in a given, given time or not. Uh, but we can also talk about lesion location. So uh, cognitive control has been associated with the multiple demand uh, system network, which is presented here um, in blue. Uh, that covers actually bilateral dorsal part of the frontal cortex versus, for example, language system that primarily um, has been has been suggested to primarily deal with syntax and semantics and covers the inferior frontal gyrus and anterior and posterior parts of the temporal cortex. Uh, so not surprisingly, probably, I mean, many people with aphasia also have at least uh, some lesions to the, to the multiple demand network system. Another source of cognitive control variability in aphasia uh, could be fatigue. So fatigue is actually one of the most frequently reported symptoms in aphasia uh, that affects communication, uh, but also daily participation and engagement in daily activities. Uh, and unfortunately, fatigue is not uh, well studied uh, in people with aphasia. And the reasons uh, people have provided is that people with aphasia have language difficulties. So that's why it's, it's really, it's unfeasible to, to, to study fatigue. However, we need to remember that cognitive control is effortful, and as such, it can be impacted by fatigue. Uh, and finally, we, we can talk about um, item variability, so conflict strength, as I call it. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, cognitive control is needed when there is conflict. So in case of, for example, sentences, different sentences may trigger conflict to different extents, depending on how uh, strong is the, is the conflict between the cues, okay? So if you if you if you see the, the two examples here, the doctor was treated by the patient versus the cat licked the lion. Uh, here, both scenarios are possible to happen, but one is probably less probable than the other one. So the conflict, I hope you agree with me, would be stronger in the first example than the second example. Okay, so I hope that. At this point, I kind of convinced you that understanding the role of cognitive control in comprehension deficits in aphasia is critical, and it's critical for seven reasons. It's critical to develop more tailored interventions, improve diagnostic precision, and also um, improve recovery prediction. So how can we study cognitive control and comprehension deficits? Uh, I'm going to be talking about two ongoing projects um, that uh, me and my colleagues are working on. The first one is using uh, electroencephalography, so EEG during sentence comprehension tasks. And here we are investigating uh, how people with aphasia process semantic or syntactic anomalies and whether there are any individual differences at the level of sentence comprehension. And in the second uh, project I'm going to be talking about, uh, here we use a cross-task design and multi-model measures to investigate if activating cognitive control can actually improve sentence processing. I'm going to start one with the first project, so the EEG project. And before I actually jump into the, um, the methods and analysis and results section, I want to give you a little bit of background, okay? Uh, so EEG measures electrical activity in the brain, and it's also a powerful tool for investigating how sentences unfold in real time. And here we have a, a 
typical scenario, what we would do um, with a participant when they are performing a language task. So you have a participant uh, sitting in a chair, and pressing, let's say, a yes and no, uh, putting the, the, the hand on the yes and no placards. We have our EEG acquisition cap that actually records the brain activity. This uh, signal is then uh, transferred to the uh, via EEG amplifier, and we can then actually uh, decode the signal. And this is how the signal looks like. So this is the signal from, from multiple electrodes that we collect. This is raw EEG data. And now there are many different ways of how we can analyze this EEG data, okay? One, probably the most common method is to use uh, what's called averaging. So we can average um, the signal from specific electrodes for specific, uh, from specific electrodes for specific stimulus or for specific events. Uh, and it will look something like this. So this is called event-related potentials, okay? And there are two event-related potentials associated with language. We have N400 and a P600. And here in this plot, what I'm showing you is we have microvolts on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And we have these two components that, come, that I'm going to explain to you in a, in a sec, okay? Um, so N400 is this uh, negative component with more central frontal uh, distribution that peaks around 400 milliseconds after the presentation of a particular stimulus. So for example, if you hear a sentence such as, he spread the warm bread with socks, here socks is highly unpredictable in this, in this context. So we will see a nice negatively going um, effect in uh, when we analyze your, your EEG date, okay? Uh, and traditionally, this N400 has been uh, defined as an index of semantic anomaly. However, more recently, uh, we also know that uh, N400 is associated with lexical retrieval, semantic integration, and prediction, indexing automatic response. P600, in contrast, it's a positive component, and it's a component with more posterior distribution that peaks around 600 milliseconds after the presentation of a stimulus. So here, if you hear a sentence, as the turtle grows, it shall grow too. So 600 milliseconds after hearing grow, we will see this nice positive, uh, positive effect. Uh, traditionally, P600 has been associated with syntactic anomaly. However, more recently, uh, it's more about reanalyses, uh, monitoring and repairing errors, as well as sentence integration. Um, and in contrast to N400, it indexes controlled responses. Okay, so what do we know about N400 and P600 in aphasia? Spoiler alert, not that much, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So ERP studies of people with aphasia are actually limited. They are quite challenging to run. And uh, those studies that, uh, that have analyzed ERPs with people with aphasia, we actually see mixed results. Uh, in terms of mixed results, uh, so N400 and P600 have often been shown to have reduced amplitude, so the effects are actually smaller in people with aphasia than in neurotypical adults. We also see a delayed latency, so the effects occur later. Uh, often we also see different distributions, so often the effects are seen in more, more anterior parts of the brain. Uh, and N400 and P600 has been shown to be modulated by the severity of comprehension impairment. Interestingly, however, we see similar findings with older populations, and this has been actually explained in terms of um, cognitive decline with age. So all these mixed results, although limited, uh, I think they are suggested that, suggested that there, is, there are some individual differences that we can actually observe with ERPs in people with aphasia. However, we need more consistency if we want to use this as a clinical or diagnostic tool. So here when comes our study. So in this study, again, we are interested in individual differences at the level of, of sentence comprehension. So for this study, uh, we recruited two adults with agrammatic aphasia. They will be labeled, their IDs will be A1 and A2. Um, agrammatic aphasia is a type of aphasia that's characterized with uh, difficulties with sentence processing, but also sentence production of the sentences. Uh, so it's a, a little bit more moderate type of aphasia. And we also recruited two adults with mild aphasia, so M1 and M2, um, as well as eight neurotypical adults. 
Uh, we heard, sorry, clarification. Can you say more about vial the basics? Are they recovered? Are they anomic? Are they recovered from some other? Yes, I can. I will be actually talking about the background test and give give you some uh, some of the results. So hopefully that will clarify. But all participants were were in their chronic stage uh, of aphasia. Uh, but yeah, if I don't answer this in my next slide, please go. Let's come back to it. Okay. Okay, so in terms of uh, background tasks, uh, we assess participants on their comprehension level. So we used a Western aphasia battery and a Philadelphia comprehension batteries tests. We also uh, assess participants on cognitive control tasks. Uh, here we used a Stroop task. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar on this of the Stroop task, I'm gonna give you an example right now that would be also useful um, for my for my next study that I'm gonna show you. So in a Stroop task, uh, participants uh, see words, color words, and they have to indicate uh, the, the font color of those words, okay? So if participants see blue written in blue, the font of the color is blue, okay? And this is our congruent condition. But instead, we can have a situation like this when the word blue is written actually in, in a red font, and this is an incongruent condition. On such incongruent conditions, uh, as you can, I hope, imagine there is a conflict, right? There is a conflict between the word meaning and the font color, okay? Uh, so here on the incongruent uh, condition, we need cognitive control to resolve this conflict, okay? So this is how we assess uh, cognitive control in our, in our participants. Now let's move on to the EEG tasks that we presented to the participants. Uh, so we conducted uh, two auditory sentence acceptability judgment tasks with our group of participants. Uh, the first one was uh, to judge whether the sentences were semantically acceptable or whether they were anomalous. So here an example is, he got a tissue and blew his nose versus he got a tissue and blew his key. And in the other task, uh, participants had to judge whether the sentences were sy syntactically acceptable or whether they were anomalous. And an example is the following. The team blames him for the loss versus the team blames he for the loss. On both of those tasks, participants were asked to um, judge by, by placing their the hand on the yes and no placards to judge whether the sentence was acceptable or not. And these two types of um, auditory sentence acceptability judgment tasks, they are pretty common in EEG literature. So these are pretty standard uh, tasks to use to elicit N400 uh, effect for the semantically acceptable versus anomalous sentences, and P600 for uh, syntactically acceptable versus anomalous sentences, okay? Um, so looking at uh, how people with aphasia perform on those type of sentences is actually critical because first of all, we can, uh, we can figure out whether uh, people with aphasia can detect the anomaly and whether they can process semantic and syntactic information correctly. Okay, so now on to uh, the results. I'm going to be showing you the results from the background uh, test, but also from the from the EG task. So here I um, I'm comparing the A1 versus A2 results. So again, these are two agromatic uh, participants. In terms of comprehension, uh, comprehension of these two participants were uh, were similar. So they were both in the range of uh, 60 to 70 percent of of the comprehension level based on Western aphasia battery and Philadelphia comprehension battery. In terms of aphasia severity, however, um, A2 actually had a much lower score than A1, suggesting a more severe aphasia. In terms of cognitive control, both participants performed well on our tasks, so no clear cognitive, well, good cognitive control abilities. We also looked at how participants performed in terms of accuracy on the sentence acceptability judgment task, so the one used during the EEG. Uh, here we actually see that A1 performed slightly poorer than A2. And now we're moving on to the ERP patterns. Uh, the ERP patterns I'm going to show you, uh, they are, um, these will be the plots for the semantic anomaly task. And this is because for the syntactic anomaly versus acceptable sentences, we actually don't see uh, clear effects, which is actually not surprising. So once again, these are the participants who struggle with sentence uh, processing, so who may struggle with structural processing of the sentences. So it's no surprise probably that we don't uh, really see uh, much happening at the level of, of P600. Okay, so uh, 
this is how, how the results look like. So here I'm showing you uh, an ERP plot. Once again, we have microvolts on the on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. The, the black line represents our uh, acceptable sentences and the red represents our anomalous sentences. So basically, we are looking at the difference between the two lines, okay? And hopefully, you can already notice that we do see this, this nice negative difference for the, uh, for the two types of sentences, okay? So this is actually our N400 effect. That's more or less between 400 to 700 milliseconds, okay? So that's great, great for A1. What's happening with A2? Well, we see a slightly different pattern. As you can see, there's not much happening around 400 milliseconds, but instead there is actually a nice P600 effect that's actually happening from 600 milliseconds onwards, okay? So what does it mean? Well, for A1, we actually see a predicted response. So this participant is showing neurotypical like uh, response to our task. Oops. However, A2 is showing a delayed response. So this participant is still clearly detecting the anomaly, but it's happening later. Now let's move on to M1 versus M2. So these were our uh, participants with mild aphasia. And what does it mean? So they had a similar comprehension scores on the Western aphasia battery and Philadelphia comprehension battery. They were all in the range of um, 80 and 90%. In terms of aphasia severity, uh, no, no problems here. They were both high functioning individuals. However, in terms of cognitive control, we actually see a difference between these two participants. So actually M2 uh, is showing some uh, cognitive control impairments, at least as measured with our troop test. Sentence acceptability judgment task, participants were at ceiling here, so no problem. And once again, I'm going to show you the ERP patterns. Uh, and here I'm going to be showing you just an example from the semantic uh, anomaly task. But just to let you know that the syntactic anomaly task shows actually um, a very similar, very similar results. So this is what we have for M1. I hope you can now notice that here we have once again this N400 signal, the N400 effect. However, we also have some late P600 effect for the same participant, okay? It's, it's occurring slightly later from, from 800 milliseconds onwards, uh, but that's, that's actually, um, we actually see similar patterns in our neurotypical adults group. And often when we see this biphasic signal, so this N400 followed by P600, uh, it's often the case when we ask participants to, to make a response decision on, on each trial. So as you remember, our participants have to judge whether the sentence was acceptable or not. And this is often what happens when we have, when, when they have to react on every sentence rather than just, for example, listening to sentences, okay? So this is what we have for N1. What's happening with N2? Well, unfortunately, we don't see any effects. So this pattern is a little bit unclear, unclear in contrast to M1 for whom we are actually seeing a predicted response, okay? So just to summarize, what I've just said, um, despite similar comprehension level, A1 showed neurotypical like ERP signatures, while A2, A2 did not. And this probably aligns with A2's more severe data. And while both M1 and M2 demonstrated good comprehension, their cognitive control abilities differ. And this is also consistent with the ERP results. So M1 displayed ERP effects across both tasks, indicating neurotypical like sentence processing, whereas M2 did not. So interim conclusions from this study, um, we've shown that there is variation in comprehension of anomalous sentences among people with aphasia who look similar on the, on the surface. Uh, and aphasia severity, uh, cognitive control abilities, and ERP patterns can help distinguish these variations. Uh, this potentially holds valuable theoretical and clinical in insights into how speech comprehension differs in people with aphasia and how we can personalize treatment based on these differences. So now knowing that there is variation in comprehension and that some comprehension deficits may actually stem from cognitive control deficits, can we rehabilitate cognitive control for improved comprehension? And that's actually one of the goals of my, of my next study. So in this next study, once again, we use a cross task design and multimodal measures, and we want to see if boosting cognitive control can actually improve sentence processing. Once again, before I jump into the, um, the actual study, I want to give you a little bit of background to situate you all on the same page. 
So what do I mean by cross-task design? So researchers can actually interleave trials from two different tasks. So we can interleave trials from a cognitive control task, such as a troop task, with trials from a sentence comprehension task, such as sentence to picture matching trial. Okay. So once again, um, on the on the troop task, participants had to um, indicate the the font color of the color words. Once again, we have congruent condition without any conflict, and we also have the incongruent condition when there is conflict and there's this need for cognitive control. In a sentence comprehension task, we can actually manipulate the sentences in a similar way. So we can have sentences without any conflict, which will be our congruent condition. And this is, for example, the patient was treated by the doctor. But we can also have this conflict between syntax and semantics, which will be the doctor was treated by the patient. And this is our incongruent condition. So on the incongruent condition, once again, we have the conflict. We need cognitive control to resolve this conflict. So now we can ask the question, is it easier to process conflicting sentences when cognitive control is upregulated? So what I mean by that is when we resolve conflict on a prior trial. So this is how it will look like. So here I'm just showing you, uh, these are the conflicting sentences, okay? So our incongruent condition. And we wanna ask if manipulating prior troop trial, the congruency of the prior troop trial, whether this can facilitate or not the processing of conflicting sentences, okay? And actually, what previous studies have shown is that yes, it is possible and it's actually called conflict adaptation. So this conflict adaptation is prior cognitive control upregulation that facilitates subsequent conflict resolution, okay? And it has been shown multiple times with uh, neurotypical adults, also with uh, some neurological populations such as schizophrenia, depression, ADHD, autistic spectrum disorder, trauma, and Parkinson's disease. However, not really yet in people with aphasia, at least not at the level of sentence comprehension. So this is exactly one of what we wanna tackle with this study. So can people with aphasia upregulate cognitive control for improved comprehension? Uh, for this study, we recruited four adults with uh, mild, at, six, at least six months post-stroke aphasia, and uh, we also had lesion information available for three of the participants. And this is just an infographic showing you um, what our participants actually did. So the whole study uh, was four to five sessions. Participant, each participant took part in four conflict adaptation sessions. And during these sessions, we presented those interleaved uh, cognitive control trials and interleaved with uh, sentence comprehension trials. Uh, so here are the sessions. And at the end of each session, uh, participants also self-reported their well-being and potential for fatigue of the day of testing. And uh, before, before our conflict adaptation experiment, participants also did a background uh, assessment, assessments that included, once again, our comprehension tasks and also um, cognitive control assessment, okay? So how did it look like? Well, participants uh, came in, they sat in front of the computer, uh, we reported participants' responses using uh, a joystick, and we also reported participants' eye movements using our eye link camera. Uh, once again, this was an interleaved task where we interleave um, cognitive control trials with sentence comprehension trials. And I'm going to first show you our uh, cognitive control task. So here we actually used a modified version of the Stroop which was, uh, it was modified such that it was an auditory version of this group. So in such version, participants were listening to a male or a female speaker saying boy or girl, and they had to indicate by selecting either the gray square if they heard uh, a male speaker or a black square if they heard uh, a female speaker. And again, similarly to the classical Stroop task, we had a congruent and incongruent condition. So the congruent condition could be like that. Boy. So here the, the gender of the speaker matches with what the speaker is saying, and here is the incongruent condition. Boy. So this is how it looked like. Uh, we chose the this auditory version of the Stroop task actually for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was that uh, we wanted to um, mitigate any reading difficulties that participants may have, but also to um, 
to reduce costs from switching modalities between the interleaf trials. So the next test I'm going to show you it's it's auditory in nature. So we also wanted to keep the auditory nature of this troop task. So for the sentence comprehension task, we presented participants with um, it was a sentence to picture matching task where participants heard a sentence and they had to match the picture that matched the sentence best. And similarly to our stroop task, again, we had congruent and congruent condition. Congruent condition sounded like that. The cop handcuffed the robber. So there is no conflict between syntax and semantics, but instead here. The robber handcuffed the cop. Here, once again, we have the conflict between the information that's imposed by syntax and semantics. Uh, in terms of our pictures, we always had a target picture, a reversal picture that was basically um, depicting the scenario with reverse thematic roles, related picture that was let me use that related picture that actually had at least one of the elements um, of the scenario from the target scenario, an unrelated picture. Um, and also, just to let you know, we also uh, looked at the strength of the conflict within those sentences. So we looked at how neurotypical a group of neurotypical adults performed of these sentences in terms of reaction times. And actually, we found that some sentences elicited conflict more strongly than others. And we also analyze our data only on those items. Uh, we measured uh, participants' reaction times, and this was a measure um, chosen to uh, to assess offline sentence processing. So, what's happening really after post interpretation? And we also uh, measured uh, eye fixation. So, eye fixations were measured uh, where are participants looking at the screen, particularly uh, where are they fixating their gaze on the target picture? Okay. And eye fixation or eye tracking is a really useful method to, to look at online sentence processing. Uh, so we can, we can actually understand a little bit better how people uh, interpret sentences as they unfold in time. Okay, so in real time, how they process sentences. And it's actually, this actually, this eye tracking method has been found useful uh, for detecting often subtle, subtle um, effects that could be otherwise missed with uh, behavior or overt measures such as reaction time or accuracy. Um, so here are our predictions. So once again, we are looking at conflicting sentences only. And again, we are asking whether manipulating auditory stroop congruency, whether this will have effect on how easy we process conflicting sentences, okay? So we hypothesize conflict adaptation as being indicated by faster reaction times on processing conflicting sentences when prior auditory stroop was incongruent in comparison to when it was congruent, but also as more eye fixations to target pictures while processing conflicting sentences when the previous auditory stroop trial was incongruent than it was congruent. First, let's start, start with some uh, background measured results. So in terms of comprehension, uh, once again, our participants uh, uh, showed similar level of comprehension. It was actually very good. They, they scored really high on all our tests. In terms of cognitive control, uh, here, interestingly, one participant actually showed poorer cognitive control than the others, suggesting some impairments at the level of cognitive control. Then we asked whether any of the participants had um, lesion to the multiple demand network system. Uh, here, it looks like we found that P1 and P2, they did have some overlap, lesion overlap with the MD system. We didn't have information for P3, but no such overlap for our last participant, P4. And finally, we asked whether there might be any potential fatigue confound to, um, to how participants recruited cognitive control. And here we actually found that P3 and P4 they actually reported some potential for fatigue or poorer overall well-being on one of the sessions. So again, there were four sessions. On one of the sessions, they reported being more fatigued. Because of the potential fatigue uh, effect on, on cognitive control recruitment, we also only analyzed the sessions without, uh, without reported fatigue. And now, now on to our, our main result from the conflict adaptation. So I'm going to first show you uh, the reaction time results. Uh, and uh, here we were looking at whether, once again, auditory stroop congruency, whether it can be a good predictor of the reaction time 
while processing conflicting sentences. Here we found that only P4 showed conflict adaptation in reaction times. And what I'm showing you here is that we have Y, uh, we have reaction time in milliseconds on the Y axis and auditory strip congruency on the X axis, also represented in colors. And we can see that this participant is faster while, while he processes conflicting sentences when they are preceded by incongruent strip trial. Now I'm going to move on to the um, to the uh, eye fixation analysis, and here we used the growth curve analysis, which is a, a pretty robust method for analyzing eye fixations. Once again, we were looking at the effect of auditory strip congruency, um, and this is what we have, what we found. So we have P1 and P4 who showed conflict adaptation in eye fixations, and what I'm showing you here is the proportion of fixations. Uh, on the y-axis, uh, time uh, time window um, here represented in time bins of 100 milliseconds on the x-axis. And once again, auditory stroop is represented in colors. And what you can see here, so if you look at the, the solid blue line, it's it's more or less, it's it stays flat, pretty flat. However, the incongruent auditory stroop, their orange uh, dotted line, we can see that there is this rapid growth in fixations when auditory stroop is incongruent. Again, this is only for processing incongruent sentences. So I'm just going to summarize what I just showed you. Uh, so P4 shows conflict adaptation in both behavioral and eye tracking measures. Um, just a reminder, this participant did not have any uh, lesion to the multiple demand system network. Uh, also showed good, good cognitive control abilities. Um, however, this participant could have been impacted by Fatigue. So it's important to measure more formally fatigue in persons such as P4. Uh, crucially, however, improvements in reaction times or this conflict adaptation in reaction times could be useful potentially uh, in more functional communication. So, for example, in turn taking. Uh, and given that this participant showed conflict adaptation in both eye tracking measures and reaction times, we believe that he's a prime candidate for potential conflict adaptation treatment, but this has to be. Um, will have to be um, investigated in the next phase of this research. P1 instead shows conflict adaptation and eye tracking only. Um, interestingly, so this is the participant who was actually at ceiling on our on all our comprehension tests. So he can resolve conflict. We know that based on the background testing. However, he has cognitive control deficits and a lesion to the multiple demand network. Uh, so we think that this participant, it does look like you know he can arrive to the for the to the correct interpretation, but the difficulties that he's uh, he's facing may actually uh, be because of um, difficulties in making overt behavioral responses. Okay, so that's why we don't see conflict adaptation and reaction times. Uh, interim conclusions from this study: so conflict adaptation is possible in aphasia, but there is variability between individuals. Multimodal measures can potentially disentangle these variabilities and also detect effects that could be missed using, for example, over behavioral measures alone. And so future directions. So what we're planning to do um, next, I mean, how to investigate those differences between, for example, P1 and P4. So we can ask questions, can cognitive control be enhanced in cases of impairment, such as in cases of P1? Or do benefits from conflict adaptation only manifest in people with aphasia with preserved cognitive control abilities? So, for example, in P4. Also, who among these two participants or individuals would show actually more uh, enduring effects? Could we see some generalizability to sentences with lower conflict strength? And finally, and I think which is uh, clinically very important, is could we see improved comprehension accuracy if we uh, if we recruit individuals with more severe aphasia? Okay, so conflict adaptation, is it a potent, potential treatment approach? Well, the work presented here was seated at the proof of concept stage within the translational research pipeline. Uh, we've investigated individual differences with um, using EEG, and also we investigated the feasibility of conflict adaptation with, with people with aphasia. And our findings suggest that, first of all, there is variability uh, at the level of sentence comprehension, and also that some people with aphasia can enhance sentence processing by engaging cognitive control. So rehabilitating cognitive control abilities could be potentially a complementary approach to linguistic treatment for aphasia. 
Just to wrap it up, understanding individual differences is a building block towards de developing more personalized treatment. And we believe that ERP patterns, lesion profiles, and cognitive control abilities could be potential guidelines for selecting patients who actually might benefit from adaptation-based treatment. And I have just a last slide with a take-home message. Uh, so I hope you, I convinced you that there is a strong link between cognitive control and language comprehension. That also some uh, that cognitive control deficits can be one of the reasons of comprehension impairments. And finally, incorporating cognitive control in a phasia treatment is a potential novel avenue for rehabilitating language skills. And I would like to thank my all my collaborators, uh, everybody here at, at MRI. And as promised, this is the slide with the CNE credit. And I thank you very much for your attention. Have you thought about combining your EG and eye tracking methodologies? I know that it's a little bit tricky because I'm mm -hmm. a mess of an EG data, but mm -hmm. there are some papers about how to combine them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a very interesting point and um, definitely worth um, pursuing, hopefully, in the future. It is challenging, as you're saying, um, because, yeah, participants will have to make a response on every single on every single trial, this uh, introduces some movements. Uh, but then I'm thinking, you know, what will be our hypotheses in terms of what we would like to see in the ERPs? So I think we're still not there yet. Uh, we do have some plans. So we are actually looking at how um, at the ERP effects when people with aphasia process um, sentences containing, for example, uh, conflict between syntax and semantics. So this is ongoing, but we don't see any any clear effects as yet but yeah thank you um so i have two questions mm -hmm. uh one what exactly is cognitive control and the second question is uh is there are there like different ways to augment it any question mm -hmm. uh yeah so the question was what is cognitive control and how can we augment it uh so cognitive control well it's a it's a pretty broad uh, term it can, uh, it's a mechanism, it's a type of executive function that actually can, uh, can help you direct your um, information processing and behaviors towards particular goals. Here in this study, I'm particularly looking at this one aspect of cognitive control. So this ability to, how can you detect and resolve conflict between mental representations? Um, and the second uh, point of your question was uh, how we can augment it. Well, so hopefully this conflict adaptation paradigm shows you that, you know, when you have two, when you have to resolve conflict one by one, this is this kind of boost that cognitive control can give you. So this upregulation of cognitive control. So hopefully, is that, is that the good right answer to your question? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you're absolutely correct that um, cognitive the real dearth of understanding of comprehension deficits in people with aphasia and an even worse dearth of treatment. Um, so I just was wondering, the auditory stroop test made me think of it. So we, you know, there's a fairly long history of evidence that people with aphasia have working memory deficits, mm -hmm. particularly verbal working memory deficits. Um, and there's, in that test in particular, there seems to be quite a substantial working memory load. Mm -hmm. um, even more so than in a kind of a typical stroop. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if you have any, uh, if you made any observations about the potential influence of working memory for these individuals, mm -hmm. um, and if you want to, if you even kind of have any assessments that that yeah. were teasing that out. Yeah. Thank you so much for this question. So the question was whether um, with the auditory stroop task uh, that this task can. Um, add additional load on working memory and whether we do any assessments on, the, on, on that. Is that a good summary? Okay. Uh, so thank you so much, first of all, for this question, because this is actually something that we've been discussing this morning. Uh, so you're absolutely right that the working memory is, um, is crucial in, in our auditory stroop task. And uh, actually, so the idea with this project is to move it forward and test it with more, with people who have more severe aphasia or like moderate aphasia, right? So we actually um, already invited a few participants who struggle, whose comprehension is a bit poorer, 
uh, to see how they're performing on, on such a task or a similar task. And actually, although one of the participants did very well, like no problems with understanding on the tree stroop task, the one that we're using, the other participant actually uh, just couldn't get it. And I think the participant couldn't really understand the task because there was this additional association between the colors and the and the, the actual, yeah, the, the, the words and the, the and, task. Yeah, and even if the person did understand, mm -hmm. I can I could see a scenario where there was a lot of questioning about, you know, yeah. so wait, what am I supposed to do? Am yeah. I supposed to do it when it's an email or am I supposed to do it when it's not? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely, it is It is complex. We do a lot of practice before, I mean, we did a lot of practice trials. We also did practice with the joystick so they can familiarize themselves with all, all the movements and stuff. So this is all in place. We also actually collected, I didn't mention that, but we did collect for, for the mild participants in our conflict adaptation study, we did collect working memory assessment and they were all at the similar level. Uh, but yes, if we move on to uh, participants with more severe aphasia, this might be a bit more tricky. So we are working on modifying this this experiment better. So yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, sir. And did you say that in study two, the subjects didn't really have much comprehension deficit as, as indexed by typical? Yes, they were pretty high functioning. They had pretty good level of yeah. comprehension. I can't remember exactly what was their day score, but uh -huh. I can get that. So can you talk a little bit about whether it's a leap to go from showing any subtle differences between nor, nor neurotypical you know, mm -hmm, subjects mm -hmm. uh, to actually designing treatments for comprehension deficits, given that these subjects didn't have comprehension deficits. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, so yeah, this is again a proof of concept study, right? So we just wanted to see whether it is, you know, conflict adaptation is possible in aphasia at all. Uh, so that's why we actually selected participants who have mild aphasia. And I can get to you uh, about this and, you know, about the details of, of the profiles uh, after the presentation. Uh, but we do see, first of all, we do see variability, right? So uh, we do see variability in terms of who actually shows this conflict adaptation and who doesn't, right? Which I think this is already a good first step or like first finding. But then second of all, um, even though, of course, accuracy, comprehension accuracy would be much more important uh, in terms of uh, clinical uh, assessments or diagnostic. Uh, we do see this benefit of reaction times. And actually, as I mentioned, maybe this will be beneficial for, for example, functional communication or like making, deci making decisions faster or like turn taking. So potentially there is some benefit here, but uh, yes, after this study, we want to move towards uh, a different sample of, of participants with aphasia, and then hopefully we'll be able to answer your question in a bit more details. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question very naive about the, the conflict adaptation effects. Mm -hmm. How uh, long lasting do you think? Um, would it be possible that you know this the duration of the effect could vary uh, for uh, with aphasia versus for uh, the individual? So is it classical to think about it as like just a one one shot just for the next trial? Or can you imagine that it could last more for a couple of trials or even yes. less for mm -hmm. the yep. So so the question was uh, how long lasting are the effects of conflict adaptation? And again, this is a great point because uh, so far conflict adaptation has been shown at the kind of immediate response level. So it's like a trial to trial. There are some studies looking at, you know, let's say three trials uh, before and how this affects uh, conflict resolution, but not really, you know, beyond that. So that's what, that was also one of my uh, kind of future direction question is, would we see any effect if we introduce it more, if we introduce it for a longer period of time, would we see any long lasting effect? Can actually people with aphasia, you know, adapt to this kind of uh, task and, and, and get benefit out of it? So. To be to be confirmed. Related to that, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's just right here. Oh, did you want to? Oh yeah. Well, my question was about. So, you're using conflict to kind of increase cognitive control, right? Is, is that was is my understanding correct on that? Well, we are using conflict. Well, first of all, when you have conflict, then kind of your cognitive control kicks in, okay. right? So we're using this in to kind of help you with processing another conflict. Okay, so so 
what do you should make sense that if they don't, if they have pro pro problems with cognitive control, right? Mm -hmm. Then the conflict's not going to help increase that. It's just going to. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. It, it depends how well or how much can they use this cognitive control, right? Because it may be the case that. It, they just cannot use cognitive control at all. So they don't activate this mechanism at all, but it also can be the case that they don't activate this mechanism enough. So maybe, you know, that's why maybe as, as Solen was suggesting that, you know, maybe if we look at uh, more conflicting trials in a row, maybe, you know, with some, with time, we can see some beneficial effects. So this cognitive control, conflict adaptation. This is a related question about the cognitive control test. So on that task with the with the um, incongruent voice, they did they have to respond uh, to the uh, the the gender of the voice, yes. right? Yes. Did you co-vary for success on that on those trials so that you know it gets at the whole question of whether. Mm -hmm. Were they successfully exerting cognitive control or yeah, not? Yeah. So you only looked at tries following a, a correct um, voice yes. conflict? Well, conflict? actually, our participants did brilliantly on this task. So they were like in the range of 90%. So there was actually no room for looking at only you know correct trials versus incorrect trials on the other two speed tests. So on that task, they all showed good cognitive control. Yes, you can say, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that does that you know? I'm just wondering how mm -hmm. that bears on your your conclusions. Yeah, I mean that's a very good point. I mean, um, I think interestingly is that uh, there is like high degree of variability between performances on different cognitive control tasks. So sometimes the participant can be good at the troop task, but can be performing poorer at let's say I know the flanker task. Um, and I think here is a, a kind of a huge debate on, you know, where it's out. So some participants have, for example, linguistic cognitive control that's, uh, you know, they show impairments at, or it's more general mechanism of cognitive control that's impaired. So I think it can vary, but it's a good point that, you know, why they performed so well on the other three stroop tasks, but then not so well on the on the stroop task. Yeah, and it might be useful, you know, rather than being a you know, yeah. it's always there's always room to, for another study, but mm -hmm. really designing a task where you can see variability and success at that yeah. at, the, at those trials, mm -hmm. then you can really look at whether their ability to successfully resolve the conflict yeah. then bears on this congruency sequence. Yeah, effect. yeah. No, that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am just wondering if you. So the conflict adaptation where you increase cognitive control after you present them with the conflict, mm -hmm. do you see them increasing their control in the next trial, even if it's a congruent kind of trial, they're just doing better overall in mm -hmm. general? Mm -hmm. okay. That's also a very interesting question. And uh, there are definitely studies that are looking at it. So they are looking if cognitive control basically is, is only needed when there is conflict and it only improves uh, sentence that contains conflict, or it's more, it has a more broader role in sentence processing. And actually, uh, we did look at that, and we see that this P4 participant, he's actually also showing improvements at processing, well, improvements in terms of reaction times at processing sentences without conflict when a prior um, auditory troop was incongruent. So, to, for this participant, he's he's our good example here. You know, he's he's showing some really good effects. So, but yeah, this would be suggestive that cognitive control might be actually more broadly involved in in sentence processing or in language more more, more generally. Yeah, it's interesting in seeing maybe what else you could implement it so they could do better on a different type of test, not yeah. even a uh, congruent ad adaptation or mm -hmm. conflict mm -hmm. adaptation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Any friend questions? Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay. I think we're good then. Thank you so much.